Hello there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's great to be with you on this Wednesday, March 16th. And here's some of what we're talking about tonight. Ukraine's president addresses Congress, pleading for more help to stop Russia's invasion. At the leader of my niche, I'm addressing the President Biden. I wish you to be the leader of the world. Being the leader of the world means to be the leader of peace. We will have annotated excerpts of his speech and the new military support that President Biden announced today. Today was President Zelensky's first speech to Congress, but he's been making the rounds with foreign governments and legislatures, speaking to other countries while rallying his own. How much are these addresses getting Ukraine the help it needs? Also tonight, two British citizens are home after years of captivity in Iran. What did it take to get them released? And the Federal Reserve raises interest rates for the first time since 2018. Allison Morris stops by to explain what that could mean for you and for the economy. So we're nearly a month into Russia's war against Ukraine. Don't know if it feels like that long, but hundreds of people have died that we know of. Millions are displaced, and Russia has shown no signs of letting up. In the southeastern city of Melitopol, Russian forces captured the mayor last week. Tonight, President Zelensky said that the mayor has been freed. But east of there, in the port city of Mariupol, or north of there, in Kharkiv, Russia has much more control. President Zelensky has become a symbol of courage, a former comedian who just played a president on TV. He has been steadily pushing other countries to come to Ukraine's defense more fully. Today, President Zelensky addressed members of Congress. They gathered at the auditorium of the Capitol Visitor Center. He repeatedly challenged the United States to do more, and he played a video made by the Ukrainian government showing graphic images from this war. We've taken part of his speech and added some notes for context. Here is some of what Congress heard this morning. Just like many other cities and communities in our beautiful country, which found themselves in the worst war since World War II, Russian troops have already fired nearly 1,000 missiles at Ukraine, countless bombs. They use drones to kill us with precision. This is a terror that Europe has not seen, has not seen for 80 years, and we are asking for a reply, for an answer uh, to this uh, terror from the whole world. Is this a lot to ask for, to create a no-fly zone, zone over Ukraine to save people? Is this too much to ask? Humanitarian no-fly zone, something that Ukraine, uh, that Russia would not be able to terrorize our free cities. If this is too much to ask, we offer an alternative. You know what kind of defense systems we need, S-300 and other similar systems. You know how much depends on the battlefield, on the ability to use aircraft, powerful, strong air uh, aviation to protect our people, our freedom, our land, aircraft that can help Ukraine, help Europe. And you know that they exist and you have them, but they are on Earth, not in, Ukra in the Ukrainian sky. They do not defend our people. I have a dream. These words are known to each of you today. I can say, I have a need. I need to protect uh, our sky. I need your decision, your help, which means exactly the same, the same you feel when you hear the words, I have a dream. I'm addressing the President Biden. You are the leader of the nation, of your great nation. I wish you to be the leader of the world. Being the leader of the world means to be the leader of peace. Thank you. Slava Ukraine. 
That was just some of what Congress heard this morning. Let's get some more context from NBC News military analyst Jack Jacobs. He's a retired U.S. Army colonel and a Medal of Honor recipient. Colonel Jacobs, what do you think President Zelensky's goal was today in his address to Congress, and how did he do? Well, he did a great job, but I don't think he's going to be as effective as he had hoped. Uh, he asked for two things probably neither of which is going to be delivered. Uh, the first is a no-fly zone, and we've already said that we're not, going to, we're not going to do that because we'd have to enforce it. Enforcing it, this is our view, uh, enforcing it means that we're going to have to engage Russian aircraft with allied aircraft. That would, uh, that would precipitate what, in many people's view, would be a direct war with Russia and instigate World War III. Uh, exchange of nuclear weapons and so on. The second thing he asked for, uh, possible he might get them, but he probably will not, and that is the S-300 system. Now, right now, the Ukrainians are using shoulder-fired anti-aircraft weapons, by and large, and some ground-based radar-guided weapons, like the Buk anti-aircraft weapons. They have relatively short range. They've been very, very effective, but they're only effective when the uh, Russian aircraft get close to uh, the anti-aircraft weapons. The S-300 system, a Russian system, that has a range not of 5 miles or 10 miles or even 50 miles. It's got a, it's got a range of nearly 1,000 kilometers uh, or more, and that means that in the hands of people on the ground wielding them, Ukrainians wielding them, if a mistake is made, they'll be shooting down aircraft over Belarus or Russia, and that would, uh, that would precipitate the kind of engagement that the United States and its allies are wishing to, uh, wishing to avoid, Joshua. Yeah, I, I, forgive me for not having a good mental metric of kilometers to miles, but that's more than 600 miles, just to give some different perspective. Yeah, it's a long way. For what the scope it's of that was. Quite a long ways. And I hear you in terms of if they possibly got misguided, that can involve other nations very quickly. It seemed like there were a couple of big asks. One of them you mentioned, which was the no-fly zone, also the surface-to-air missiles. President Zelensky also asked for more severe sanctions. He asked Congress to close U.S. ports to Russian ships. You mentioned the hesitancy with the no-fly zone, but those S-300s came up a couple times after the speech, including from senators across the aisle. Here are Senators uh, Kelly from Arizona, Democratic Senator, and Senator Romney from Utah, and what they said about S-300s after the speech. Watch. The yes, S-300s, mm -hmm. um, you know, that missile system, you know, has a greater range, uh, greater altitude to take out, you know, Russian airplanes. Mm -hmm. S-300 and other uh, intercepting type uh, systems that will allow them to have a, a more safe sky. That's something we've got to do. Colonel Jacobs, is there something to this idea of equipping the Ukrainians to sort of create their own no-fly zone without having to involve... Uh, Western aircraft, that this is something that they might be able to do on the ground themselves if they had sophisticated enough weaponry? Well, it's a great alternative, but like I said, there's, I, I think one of the things that's keeping us from doing it is the concern that a mistake will be made and a Russian aircraft will be shot down over Russia and that, that, uh, that the United States wants to avoid. Nevertheless, if there's a great uh, groundswell of, uh, of opinion in Washington to, to do it, uh, they'll get those weapons. The other thing that uh, the Ukrainians need uh, is something that they've used to enormously positive effect uh, in their own defense, and that is Javelin anti-tank missiles. They need a resupply of those and for them to continue to come. Uh, the Russians have boxed themselves onto main supply routes, making them easy targets for any any uh, tank weapons. And uh, we don't want the Ukrainians to run out of them. They're extremely effective. Entire uh, mechanized and tank units have been uh, decimated by these weapons. Uh, we don't want the Ukrainians to run out of them. And more supplies are required. And they're required soon before the Russians have an opportunity to block resupply from the West, Joshua. Can you just walk me through, Colonel Jacobs, a little bit of what is involved logistically in using these weapons? I mean, I, I'm, I'm not military, so I don't know what it takes if someone put one of these weapons in my hand to actually aim it and prepare it, load it, and fire it. 
but I imagine that the logistics of teaching soldiers how to use it, making sure they can transport it safely, making sure they can aim it accurately, fire it, carry it back, are all part of the thought process in terms of what gets sent where. Are, are we talking about big, sophisticated weaponry that requires advanced training or something that's basically point and shoot? It doesn't, it, it requires training to be sure, uh, requires coordination between a gunner and an assistant gunner, but this is not something that can't be learned relatively quickly. You remember the attack that took place on the military base in western Ukraine. Well, their uh, allied uh, soldiers were training Ukrainians uh, to use those weapons. So it, it takes a while, but not a very long while. What they really require, because they do have crews who can use them, who have experience using these weapons, uh, what they really need are more, more, more Javelin anti-tank missiles and more anti-aircraft missiles. They have the troops who can use them, who are trained to use them. They just need more supplies. Before I have to let you go, I should ask you about what President Biden said today. He announced the U.S. is providing another $800 million in security assistance, including anti-aircraft systems and anti-armor systems, small arms, body armor, about 20 million rounds of ammunition. Also today, President Biden referred to Vladimir Putin as a war criminal for what we believe was the very first time. Watch. Before we go, how do you see this uh, shift in the U.S. posture? Is this kind of an increase in support that we always sort of expected, or does any of this surprise you at all? No, it's not surprising at all. I, I think that the, the indomitable courage of the Ukrainian people, the leadership of President Zelensky has, has galvanized uh, both sides of the aisle to support uh, what is a, 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 effectively a defense of an attack on freedom and on Europe. Um, calling him a war criminal is, I think it's, calling Putin a war criminal, is, I guess it's intuitively obvious to a casual observer. Uh, thwarted in their ability to just march in and take over Ukraine, they began, the Russians began indiscriminately killing civilians, bombing and rocketing uh, apartment buildings and hospitals and so on. And by the way, they will continue to do that until they are stopped or they run out of ammunition. I, it's, uh, I, I think uh, if a poll were taken among people who, who, who were just looking at it even for the first time, uh, the conclusion would be that Putin's a war criminal, Joshua. And we'll talk more about what these kinds of declarations may or may not mean a little bit later in the program. Colonel Jack Jacobs, we appreciate you, sir. Thank you very much. Every day of this war raises a lot more questions for us, maybe for you too. If so, send them our way. We'd like to get you some answers. Send us your questions on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, at NBC Now Tonight. No question is too big or too small, and of course, there's no such thing as a dumb question. We'd rather you just ask. Feel free if you like to leave us a voicemail, 888-575-2NBC. That's 888-575-2622 or email us now tonight at NBCnews.com. Our panel of experts will answer your questions later this week. So we just heard what President Zelensky wants from the US, but what about from the rest of the world? We'll compare what he told Congress to what he has told other world leaders. We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. President Zelensky's address to Congress played on themes we've heard in his previous speeches. He's calling on Western countries to defend democracy and to remember when they have done so before. Listen to the common bonds in his remarks to leaders in Canada, the U.S., and the U.K. Members of the Congress, ladies and gentlemen, Americans, friends. Mr. Speaker, Prime Minister, dear Justin, Members of the government, members of the parliament. I'm addressing all people in the UK, all people of the United Kingdom, of the great people with great history. I'm proud to greet you from Ukraine, from our capital city of Kiev. 
a city that is under missile and airstrikes from Russian troops every day. Each city that they are marching through, they are taking down the Ukrainian flags. Can you imagine someone taking down your Canadian flags in Montreal and other Canadian cities? Can you imagine famous CN Tower in Toronto? If, they, if it was hit by Russian bombs. Imagine that someone is taking siege lane siege to Vancouver. Can you just imagine them for a second? I remember your national memorial in Rushmore. The faces of your prominent presidents, those who laid the foundation of the United States of America as it is today, democracy, independence, freedom, and care for everyone, for every person, for everyone who works diligently, who lives honestly, who respects the law. We in Ukraine want the same for our people. To be or not to be, you know this Shakespeare question. And I want to remind you the words that you already heard in the UK and which are important. We won't resist, we won't lose. We will go to the end and we will fight in the sea, we will fight in the air, we will defend our land. Whatever the price is, we will fight in the forests, we will fight in the fields, in the streets, in the cities, in the hills. Remember Pearl Harbor. Terrible morning of December 7, 1941, when your sky was black from the planes attacking you. Just remember it. Remember September the 11th, a terrible day in 20, 2001, when evil tried to turn your cities, independent territories, in battlefields, when innocent people were attacked attacked from air, yes. Just like no one else expected it, you could not stop it. Our country experienced the same every day. I have a dream. These words are known to each of you today. I can say, I have a need. I need to protect uh, our sky. I need your decision, your help which means exactly the same, the same you feel when you hear the words, I have a dream. And as the leader of my nation, I am addressing the President Biden. You are the leader of the nation, of your great nation. I wish you to be the leader of the world. I am very grateful to you, Justin. I am grateful to Canadian people, and I am confident that together we will overcome and we'll be victorious. Glory to a big country. Glory to the UK. Thank you. Those are some of President Zelensky's remarks to leaders in Canada, the U.S., and the U.K. Let's continue now with Angela Stent, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and the author of Putin's World, Russia Against the West and with the Rest. Ms. Stent, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. So that was just some of the rhetoric we've heard from President Volodymyr Zelensky in the last few weeks. I wonder what your sense is just in terms of the power of that kind of diplomacy, both to make an impression on the world and to get him what he's asking for from world leaders? Well, I think it's very powerful. I th thought his speech today was very moving, um, as you can, as you showed. He, in each country where he's made this speech, he's asking for the same things, but he's tailoring it to the particular history of the country and to their moments of crisis and to their strong democracies. Um, I don't think it's going to get him the no-fly zone that he's trying to get. Uh, because I think the NATO allies are agreed that this could be provocative and it could involve, in the end, some direct conflict 
between NATO and Russia or between the U.S. and Russia, and they want to avoid that. But certainly, as you yourself said today, he got $800 million more in assistance from the U.S. As your previous guest said, what they really need are the anti-aircraft Stinger missiles, uh, and they need the anti-tank Javelin equipment. So they are getting more equipment that will enable them to fight uh, uh, the, the Russian invaders. Uh, but, you know, he is still holding out for more. Um, and I did watch an interview with uh, leader McConnell earlier on this evening where he thought, uh, not surprisingly, that the Biden administration should be doing more. So that debate is still going on in our country. Hey, let me get to some of the responses from the leaders of these three countries. President uh, Biden, also Boris Johnson, the UK's Prime Minister, and Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, in response to hearing from Ukraine's president. Watch. We're going to continue to have their backs as they fight for their freedom, their democracy, their very survival. And we're going to give Ukraine the arms to fight and defend themselves through all the difficult days ahead. The decision about the future of Ukraine has got to be for the Ukrainian people and for, uh, for Volodymyr Zelensky as, as, as their elected leader. Democracies around the world are lucky to have you as our champion. This is a really remarkable response to someone whose profile on the world stage in the scheme of things is really rather new. How do you see just that relationship between world leaders, especially Western world leaders, making a point of verbally, vocally, emphatically aligning themselves with Mr. Zelensky? Well, I think all these leaders, as most of the democratic world, were absolutely shocked by what Russia did. Uh, a major war in Europe, the first one in 77 years, totally unprovoked. And I think those three leaders have also, and the others, have been very impressed by President Zelensky. This is a man who was a TV comedian. Uh, he played a president on TV. And people, I think, underestimated his abilities to lead. Uh, before the war, he had a 25% approval rating in Ukraine. Um, and, you know, people thought that his government wasn't doing that well. He has really risen to the occasion. And then when we see the horrible images, as we saw in the video that was played today to the U.S. Congress, of the wanton destruction uh, that Russia has, is wreaking on uh, Ukraine, I think that has inspired them. Um, and they really, they want to do all they can to support Ukraine. Um, and they've been very impressed by their dealings with him. A few more. You mentioned, by the way, uh, the sitcom that he was on. Netflix also announced today that it was putting that sitcom, Servant of the People, back on Netflix. He made that show back in 2015, and it is now streaming again. So you can see Volodymyr Zelensky, the actor, playing the president, and now Volodymyr Zelensky, the president, who is a former actor. Two more things I wanted to ask you about before I had to let you go. The United Nations uh, International Court of Justice ruled today that Russia needs to stop its war in Ukraine. We also heard from Vladimir Putin today discussing Russia's military campaign. Here is part of what President Putin said. Что касается тактики боевых действий, которая была выработана Министерством обороны России и нашим генеральным штабом, то она полностью себя оправдала. Операция развивается успешно, в строгом соответствии с заранее утвержденными планами. Just in case the type was a little small for some of you, he did say when it comes to the military tactic that was developed by the defense ministry on our general staff, it is delivered completely, the operation is successful and is going strictly to plan. I'm not sure what the world can do to make him stop. I mean, if he's willing to go invade Ukraine twice in the last decade, including this time with zero provocation and commit the atrocities that he clearly has committed, I'm not sure whether the international order is prepared with a tool that is strong and stringent enough to make this to make this stop. And in that sense, I understand why President Zelensky is asking for more. But how, how do you see the world's capacity to help stop Vladimir Putin? First of all, I would really encourage all your viewers to watch those two speeches. What a contrast. You know, a heroic leader of a country under siege and a belligerent leader, if you watch his whole speech, using language really that only Hitler used about national traitors in his own country. 
it's very difficult to stop Vladimir Putin because Russia is a nuclear superpower. And the United States is very aware of the fact and the other uh, democracies in the world, members of NATO, uh, that, you know, he might actually use them. He has made hints in the last couple of weeks that if the sanctions don't stop uh, and, uh, and if, uh, if he doesn't continue, if he continues to feel threatened by the West, you know, he will use methods that you've never seen before. Uh, and the Russians are talking about the possible use of a tactical nuclear weapon. And it's that kind of blackmail, obviously, that has, that has to make the rest of the world sit up and think very carefully, as we were saying at the beginning, about exactly what it can do. I think what could stop him will just be that this, uh, you know, this is is not going well for Russia. Uh, they thought they were going to take Ukraine in three days. They're bogged down there. Uh, they have young men whom they sent there, never explaining what they were, why they were there and what they were doing. Morale is very low. The army isn't performing that well, even though they're much more powerful, clearly, militarily than Ukraine. And they're meeting a fierce, fierce resistance. So I think the only thing that will stop him is if he realizes that it's too expensive and it's impossible to achieve the goal of taking all of Ukraine, of installing calling a puppet government uh, and then moving back to Russia. They're not going to be able to do that. Uh, meanwhile, of course, they're still bombing all these civilian targets and, and the humanitarian catastrophe is, is terrible. Um, uh, you know, uh, later on, when the, all of the sanctions bite, I think that will also cause them maybe to rethink some of this. But right now, we're unfortunately in a position where it is very difficult to stop this war if he's really yeah. intent on pursuing it. Another night I would love to continue with this in terms of the international community's response to these kind of things. That's also something that President Zelensky referred to in his address tonight, basically kind of questioning whether Western democracies have the kind of structures in place that they would need to respond to such an atrocity. But that's a conversation for another night. Angela Stent is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and author of Putin's World, Russia Against the West and with the Rest. Ms. Stent, thank you very much. Thank you. Coming up, we'll have the latest on the ground in Ukraine as its refugee crisis continues to grow. The view from Lviv when we come back. While Ukraine's President Zelensky was pleading his case to the United States Congress today, his country was being bombed. In the southern port city of Mariupol, Russian forces bombed a theater. Hundreds of Ukrainian civilians were sheltering there. Ukraine's foreign minister tweeted that the building is fully ruined and called the attack a war crime. Now, NBC News has not independently verified the attack, and it's also not clear how many civilians were killed or injured. NBC's Cal Perry joins us live from Lviv, Ukraine, which is near the border with Poland. Cal, let me just start with President Zelensky's remarks to Congress today. How has that played on the ground in Ukraine? Are they aware at all that he spoke to Congress? And if so, what's the reaction been like? No, folks here are, are absolutely aware. Um, it was broadcast live here on Ukrainian television. Um, and people here see the geopolitical need for the speech. They understand um, the larger picture, and they understand what it is President Zelensky is doing in reaching out to the West, in trying to become closer to Europe, in trying to engage uh, more with NATO. Um, and then you have, on the, on the sort of other side of that coin, you have a very real understanding that the violence is unrelenting um, against civilians. So while he was speaking, you know, the this country was learning more about Mariupol, a place not only where that theater was hit, but a place where Russian soldiers have now taken over a hospital there, um, which is basically a way of using patients um, as human shields and a way, uh, frankly, of trying to keep those who are fighting on the front from seeking medical care. Um, it is one of the most brutal tactics that you could possibly use in war. And this is a city um, that is under siege. All a long way of answering your question that people watched the speech very closely. Um, but I think people here are able to separate the message that is being sent to Washington versus the message, for example, that he is sending to his negotiators as they engage with the Russians. Because, of course, there is a real need here to hopefully, at the very least, pause the fighting to allow some humanitarian aid uh, into these places. Places, Joshua. Before I ask you about the negotiators, there was just a video posted on Telegram by the mayor of Mariupol, Vadim Boychenko, who said that in the last two days, and this is from an NBC News uh, interpreter who interpreted the video, 
that in the last two days, 6,500 private vehicles have left Mariupol. Some of them were able to get to the city of Berdyansk, which is kind of between Mariupol and Melitopol, sort of on an east-west road. He did also note that the invaders, as he put it, destroyed the drama theater, a place where more than 1,000 people found refuge. We will never forgive this. That is a quote from Mayor Vadim Boychenko, who is the mayor of Mariupol, which is in southeastern Ukraine. With regards to the negotiations, the possible negotiations, Cal, Lester Holt had an exclusive interview with President Zelensky today and asked about that possibility. Here is part of President Zelensky's response as interpreted by a Ukrainian government interpreter. Watch. There's been some reporting that uh, the framework of a deal is being hammered out, one in which you would renounce NATO ambitions, declare neutrality, not allow uh, foreign militaries to base on your land. Can you confirm any of that and update us on the status of negotiations? The negotiations are still in progress. The negotiations are fairly difficult. Um, and the current conditions of negotiation, I would say, a continue news, any war uh, could be finished at the table of negotiations. Cal, what more do we know about this? There had been some reports earlier today that there was a framework of a deal, and that didn't seem to be really solid. And we know how previous talks have pretty much gone nowhere. So what do we actually know about what's on the table and the path forward? So we understand that there is this, as you've put it, a framework, which is the only way to sort of describe it, because it is the very rough outlines of the beginnings of a deal. The headline seems to be um, that Ukraine would pass up the opportunity to be in NATO, that they would forego foreign military bases here, but that they would be allowed to, and I use that term the way the Russians are using it, they would be allowed to maintain their own army, their own territorial force here. Um, it, what's interesting about this is it could be a way to stop the bloodshed. I, I think President Zelensky is in a very difficult position where you have the need um, for people to remain prideful and um, it, is, it is amazing what the Ukrainian people have done in the face of this onslaught, this Russian invasion. That said, there are children dying in basements in Mariupol. And so he's walking this fine line where um, he doesn't want to give up anything. He certainly doesn't want to give up anything to, to an army that is invading a sovereign country. But at the same time, um, he needs to find a way to stop the violence. I, I was at a, I got at a coffee bar earlier today, just getting a cup of coffee on my way to my shift. And I turned to somebody next to me and we were having a conversation. And I said, what do you think about uh, giving up a shot at NATO? And this person said to me, with the amount of weapons that are coming into Ukraine, NATO is going to want to join us. And I, it's, it's very instrumental and instructive in the way that President Zelensky is now framing this to the Ukrainian people, that maybe the end all be all isn't joining NATO, that maybe Ukraine has proven that it can stand up itself to Russia. And look, this country is going to forever be different. It is going to forever be different for the worse because of this invasion and all the people that are dying. And we don't know when this is going to end. But the world views Ukraine very differently. And clearly the world views Ukraine as the front line against Russia. And I do just want to repeat some of the latest that we heard from the mayor of Mariupol. He did note that in the last two days, 6,500 private vehicles have left. Some have evacuated west to the city of Berdyansk. And he did note that the drama theater was attacked with more than 1,000 people finding refuge inside but didn't have any specific details on injuries or deaths. Thank you, Cal. Please stay safe as best you can. That's NBC's Cal Perry reporting tonight from Lviv. Thank you, sir. Meanwhile, in Kyiv, many people are taking shelter from this bombing. Among them are dozens of babies who were born through surrogates. President Zelensky's chief of staff is making it clear Ukraine will not give Russia any ground. From our partners at Sky News, Alex Crawford has more from Kyiv. The capital's skyline is very different now. Kyiv's 18th century St. Andrew's Church but with a backdrop of battle which is getting closer. The city's been put under strict curfew to try to limit the lives lost, but there's no protecting against attacks like these. A second missile strikes less than a minute later. The Ukrainian demands for a no-fly zone grow more ardent with every strike. 
And despite hints of progress on peace talks, the president's chief of staff told us there were red lines they would not cross. Would you be prepared to give up Donbass? Look, I say an answer to your questions. We don't discuss our freedom, our independence, our territorial integrity, our sovereignty. All another issue, we can see things and discuss. And my president, my president's ready to sitting in any days, in any place. But you're not prepared to give up any territory? Yes. No territory? Yes. They're on the lookout for Russian saboteurs. We filmed the detention of these two suspects before the capital's curfew. The Ukrainians are worried that Russian agents have infiltrated the main city and are acting as guides for possible airstrikes, leaving tags or markers on potential targets, or just acting as informants on troop and military movements. These concerns have heightened over the past 24 hours as the Russian soldiers inch closer to Kyiv and the center of Ukrainian power. Amongst those at risk of being trapped in the capital are scores of surrogate babies. There are so many, the nursery is a constant hubbub of crying demands for attention. The babies are being cared for in a basement, which has been turned into an underground shelter by a very small team of babysitters. These women have left their families to look after these little ones, after the baby's actual parents couldn't reach them because of all the fighting. You have to understand this is war, this babysitter says. Not everyone is able to come. The airports are all closed, so their parents just can't pick them up. We love all the babies, another says. As she explains, they become part of our hearts, our family. And when the parents do take them away, we cry, she tells us. But with heavy fighting around the capital, it's meant the women looking after the babies here are also all that stands between them and the bombings. There are so many acts of defiance being played out on these streets. One soldier and his flute and the national anthem, we won't be ruled by others, it goes. In so many ways, he speaks for his country. Alex Crawford, Sky News, Kiev. Before we go tonight, we'll catch up on some of the day's other big stories, including the prospects for a fourth COVID shot. Who might soon be up for an additional booster dose? Plus, the days of changing our clocks twice a year might be ending or letting our iPhones do it automatically. Congress moves closer to ending daylight saving time. And the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates. What does that actually mean? And what could it mean for you? Now to some of the day's other top headlines, beginning with Iran. It released two British citizens that have been imprisoned there for years. Sky News International Affairs editor Dominic Waghorn has that story. They are the pictures so many have longed to see. Nazanin taking her first steps back to freedom, looking so happy and relieved on the flight out of Iran. For her husband, Richard, and daughter, Gabriella, it was touch and go to the end. She wanted to come just to give me support. Uh, We've seen the photos of, of Nazanin on the plane. Um, it's been a, I mean, a long ordeal, but obviously the last couple of days where we've not been speaking, um, it's been very up and down, and it's been getting closer and closer, and, and things moved on Sunday. Uh, I mean, a huge relief. Huge relief that, that she's on a plane, that she's coming home, that she's free. And thank you to everyone who's been helping along the way. It's been a long journey that people have been keeping us, um, following it on the news, on petitions with the government. Um, I've said some rough things over the years, um, but in the end, she's coming home. Richard has campaigned relentlessly, waiting for the day he could tell his daughter a mother's coming home. Well, I suppose that we can stop being a moment in history and start being a normal family again. Um, yeah, it, it's been a long time. Um, hasn't it? We were just saying, you know, last night, Gabrielle was asking, is, is mummy really coming back tomorrow? I said, well, I don't, I don't know for sure. I think we're close to her. Um, I mean, I now know pretty surely she is coming home. 
Nazanin's ordeal began at the airport where it ended. She was leaving Tehran six years ago after a holiday introducing her daughter to her parents when Iranian security moved in. Their hidden camera catches her bewilderment, the chilling start to a hellish ordeal. The young British mother charged with trying to topple Iran's regime. The hardest bit to live with was probably that early realisation of, of her sitting in a windowless cell being interrogated, blindfolded, and I'd done nothing about it. I'm getting better at it. Before his wife's release, Richard told me about those terrifying early days. He was urged by the government to keep a low profile. He did the opposite. While his wife languished in an Iranian jail, he set about trying to galvanise public support and sympathy. Releasing photos we now know so well, campaigning and even hunger striking. Because, he says, taking government advice would only have made his wife's ordeal much worse. The consequences are you get exposed to more torture. Given those consequences, you know, can you, with a straight face, be given that advice? Transparency, openness, always protects you. The government's failure to secure Nazanin's release earlier will be the subject of intense debate. As she and Anusha Ashuri fly home, though, ministers are claiming credit and offering support. My sympathies are with the families for what they've suffered over this appalling time, and I'm delighted to be welcoming them back to the UK. My family and I are delighted to confirm that my dad has been released and will be returning to the UK today. Retired engineer Anusha Shuri from Lewisham has been held for five years. His family say they can't wait to have him home. We've missed doing so many ordinary things together. You know, we've missed birthdays, we've missed Christmases, we've missed walking the dog, uh, taking a simple holiday you know, sitting together, drinking a cup of coffee. All of this uh, is, is we have to start all over again. The government's also secured the release on furlough of British citizen and retired conservationist Morad Tabaz. But there are many other dual nationals from the UK and elsewhere still left behind. We have succeeded in our journey, but there are people who are still where we were yesterday and they don't know how long they're going to be on that journey of suffering and frustrations. Who did that one? For Nazanin, there have been so many false dawns, hopes raised and dashed. They counted down the days to the end of her first sentence, only to have another one imposed. Like, it feels like yeah. it might happen, but... For most of her life, Gabriella's known her mother from a distance on video calls. Thank you. But tonight, their family will be reunited, together again at last. Dominic Waghorn, Sky News. Some new details out of Ukraine, particularly related to the hostage situation involving the mayor of Melitopol, which is in southeastern Ukraine. We just got word from the presidential press secretary, Dasha Zarivna, speaking on Ukrainian TV, translated by NBC, about a kind of prisoner swap that happened to affect that release. According to the presidential press secretary, uh, Ivan Fedorov, who was the mayor of Melitopol, was released from Russian captivity in exchange for nine Russian soldiers. According to the presidential press secretary, they were born between 2002 and 2003, meaning these are kids. None of them is at 21 years old yet. These are very young Russian soldiers. And not to put too fine a point on it, we're basically talking about exchanging hostages for prisoners of war, a swap to get the mayor of Melitopol released. The presidential press secretary said in their comments, quote, these are practically children, conscripts who, according to the Russian Ministry of Defense, are not in Ukraine, but the whole world sees that they are here, unquote. And this gets to one of the storylines that at least Ukrainian government officials have been putting forth, that some of the Russian soldiers, in addition to having logistical challenges, are just not ready for this war, that they are very young, unprepared, and maybe not even quite sure of why they were going to Ukraine in the first place. A lot more questions than answers about that. But again, the breaking news we just got from the presidential press secretary in Ukraine, that apparently there was a prisoner swap, freeing the mayor of Melitopol, which is in southeastern Ukraine, Ivan Fedorov, in exchange for nine fairly young Russian soldiers. Again, that's coming from the Ukrainian government. Time could be running out for daylight saving under a plan that's advancing in Congress. The Senate passed a bill to make this time change permanent nationwide. The bill passed by unanimous consent. No one objected, so it advanced without needing a full formal vote. And this would mean no more setting your clock back an hour in the fall or forward in the spring or letting your iPhone do it for you. 
Now, some of you had strong feelings about this. Brian tweeted, daylight savings time is ridiculous. So glad I live in Arizona. We don't have to deal with it. And another viewer tweeted, I am a morning person. I am described as a ray of sunshine in the morning. My mental and physical health are about to drastically decline if I follow DST all year round. I want standard time because then sunrise will be around 8 a.m. all year round instead of after 8.45 a.m. in the winter. Daylight saving time has been with us for more than a century. And yes, it is saving, singular, not savings. That'll save me some tweets from angry grammarians. But the U.S. has observed it on and off since 1918. Nearly 30 states have introduced bills to end daylight saving time since 2015. Right now, it's not observed by Hawaii, Arizona, Puerto Rico, and a number of other U.S. territories. Republican Senator Marco Rubio of Florida is one of the bill's sponsors. I'm hoping that after today, this will go over to the House. They'll act quickly on it. I know this is not the most important issue confronting America, but it's one of those issues where there's a lot of agreement. And I think a lot of people wonder why it took so long to get here. The measure has yet to pass the House, and the Biden administration says the president has not taken a position on ending daylight saving time. When you pay off your credit card, you're not just covering the cost of what you bought. Unless you pay the whole thing every month, you're also paying interest. That's how the people who lent you money make money. But that interest could soon change. Today, the Federal Reserve raised those interest rates by a quarter of a percent. As you can see, it's starting to make a dent in that massive drop in the first days of the pandemic in 2020. That's when the Fed lowered rates to near zero. To put it simply, borrowing money will cost more. Mortgages and car loans and student loans could get a bit more expensive. After the vote, a statement from the Fed's Board of Governors said that the invasion of Ukraine is causing tremendous human and economic hardship. How that will impact the U.S. financial system remains a bit unclear, but now they're putting upward pressure on inflation. Here's what White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said about it today. We continue to believe that the United States economy is positioned well to deal with the challenges ahead, even as we continue to monitor. And obviously there are events that impact the economy, including an invasion of a foreign country. Um, and we're seeing that impact uh, as well play out in the economic data. Now, this might not be the last time we have this conversation in 2022. It could be the first of about a half dozen interest rate increases this year. As for the staff behind these decisions, some of them are still waiting for Senate confirmation. You may remember that during the State of the Union address, President Biden called on Congress to vote for his Fed nominees. One of them, Sarah Bloom Raskin, just pulled her nomination after Senator Joe Manchin came out against her. In a 50-50 Senate, this essentially doomed her hopes of becoming the Federal Reserve's vice chair for supervision. Also waiting for a vote on his renomination, Jay Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve. NBC News Now anchor Allison Morrison. Allison Morris joins us now with more. And Allison, could we start with what Jen Psaki said in terms of how the U.S. economy is kind of prepared to deal with the economic challenges of whatever the war in Ukraine is going to involve, if that's the case, then how does raising interest rates a quarter of a percent factor into that? Yeah, basically what you saw today is that the Fed said, mm, we're going to raise rates a quarter point because we're just not sure what's going on here. You've heard this term fog of war so much lately. We just don't have a clear picture of what's going on in Ukraine. So they're going to take small steps, see how it goes, see what goes on with the global economy so they don't do anything too drastic. Anything more we should keep top of mind in terms of what interest rates going up means for everyday consumers. Yeah, you know, I think it's just important to be clear on what it does and doesn't do, right? We talk about mortgages. If you're sitting here thinking, oh my God, I have a mortgage, is it going up? Well, if you have a fixed rate mortgage, no, it's not. If you have an adjustable rate mortgage, an ARM as they call them, those have reset points at your next reset, those are probably going to go up. If you're shopping for a mortgage and you're thinking, wait a second, Allison, the Fed only raised rates today, but mortgage rates have been going up a lot over the past weeks and months. What's going on here? Mortgages are also tied to the 10-year Treasury yield. This this is kind of a chicken and an egg situation, but the 10-year tre Treasury yield has been rising ahead of this interest rate hike. So you've already seen mortgage rates going up. They're going to go up more. If you're someone who spends on a credit card, as you laid out before, but you pay that bill every month, nothing's going to change. If you run credit card debt, keep an eye out for emails, notices from your credit card company. You may get one of those messages that in small, small print says, hey, your APR, your annual percentage rate, well, it used to be 18%, and now it's going up to 22 unless you do something about it or move your money. Be aware of those things because you could get caught off guard. 
What did it mean for the markets today when they announced that these rates were going to go up? An enormous sigh of relief, Joshua. I mean, we have been relief. waiting. Yeah, look at the markets. 510 points. I think we landed somewhere around 512. The markets paused for a hot second when this announcement came out at 2 o'clock just to see what would happen. And then they shot up. We have been expecting this to come for a while now. The Fed said, we're going to raise a quarter point today and pencil in maybe six more rate hikes throughout the year. The markets love that. Investors, Wall Street, we love certain and now we know what the rest of the year will probably look like. That gets to what I was just about to ask in terms of more rate hikes, what the markets think. So it's kind of, it may be challenging for consumers on some levels, but on a big macroeconomic Wall Street investor level, it's kind of a good thing because they know what to plan for. Yeah, you know what's coming here, right? It's not great for stocks uh, when rates go up, but you know it's happening, you know what's going on, and for goodness sake, this inflation that we have been banging the drum about over and over again, this is going to start to deal with that, and I think everyone is tired of waiting for someone to make a move. We've heard about inflation lately. We've heard about concerns over a recession lately. Mm -hmm. There are lots of things that pull on the economy. Interest rates are just sure. one of them. I don't want us to overstate the impact of this one factor, because you mentioned the 10-year Treasury yield. There's what's going on in Ukraine. There's what's happening in other markets. Currency markets are changing. The price of oil is changing. How does this fit into all the things that like consumers should be overwatching CNBC for yeah. and fretting over when it comes to how we pay our bills. I mean, don't fret, right? They raised a quarter basis point today. I, I, a lot of people actually thought maybe that wasn't enough. The St. Louis Fed president, James Bullock, raised his hand and said, I want to see a half point today. I also thought, hey, maybe the Fed should have raised rates a little bit more today. We really have to start hitting this inflation. I mean, there's a reason that I'm not on the Fed Reserve Board, but a lot of people thought maybe we should do more. So just know the Fed moves gradually and you don't need to freak out. This isn't going to make everything uh, you know, the cost of borrowing so outrageously expensive that we can't handle it. One more thing. Yeah. Uh, we prepared a timeline of Fed rates, which oh, yeah. shows this big spike in the 1980s. Oh, yeah. What was happening there with rates being so high? And, and is that something that was just kind of then, or is that something we need to look out for now? No, this will probably not happen again. I can explain why. For those of you who were not alive then, we had a whole lot going on in the early 80s. We had an oil crisis because of wars, because of an OPEC embargo. We had hyperinflation here in the United States. We're complaining about inflation now. It's 7.9% right now. In January of 1980, it was 14.6. That's nearly double. So we had hyperinflation, and the Fed just said we are going to bring this down, and they shot up interest rates. Start of 1980, interest rates in the United States, the Fed funds rate, 14%. By the end of 1980, they had gone to 19 to 20%. The Fed's projection for 2022 is to get to 1.9%. In the 80s, the Fed fund rate was 10 times that. So we are really in comfortable territory. We don't change rates the way we did in the 80s. It was kind of the wild, wild west back then. That's not going to happen today. Allison Morris, be sure to join her tomorrow and every weekday, 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern. That's 8 to 10 p.m. GMT here on NBC News Now. Thank you, Allison. Thanks, Joshua. And thank you for making time for us. Don't forget to send us your questions on the war on Ukraine for our experts. We are at NBC Now tonight on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. Leave us a voicemail or send us an email. Until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. Thanks for making time for us tonight. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.